I'm starting the recording for my conversation with Janice Ray. And uh, we're just going to wait a couple minutes for um, our registrants to join us. And um, I'll just say that I'm recording from the Rinconada branch of Palo Alto Library. And um, we have not had rain for a couple of days. We had a lot of rain. And Janice, you said it's raining where you are in Georgia. It is, along with some storm warnings, you know. Um, the very strange thing, Rebecca, is that there have a lot of hail has has fallen in you know in the general southern coastal plains. A lot in Florida, like five inches someplace in Florida a couple of days ago. So on the on the announcement, I, I just heard that there's a chance of like half inch hail. Yeah, half inch hail. It's like um, I. That's part of the strangeness of our times, right? We just have to get used to more storms and it's not going to be easy. Right yeah. now, one of the concerns out here is that we had a, a massive snowpack fall this year, which everyone was really excited about when it was happening. Um, but now it's going to melt and, yeah. you know, it's going to melt probably pretty fast. So, you know, as we try to adjust to new cycles, there's, you know, new problems to, to try to anticipate. So, and, and so that is going to mean mudslides? Potentially, potentially. Um, and also just areas that the ground is really saturated, like the water's just going to keep going to places that maybe didn't get soaked before. Even down in uh, Tulare County, apparently there's just a really big lake that formed where there used to be a lake. Um, and now it's one of those things like, all right, what do we what do we do? This is usually farmland, um, you know, but where do you I mean, the water is going to go where it wants to go. So what about the super bloom, Rebecca? H have you been out looking at the poppies and other flowers? You know, I, I feel pretty lucky because um, we have what I'm calling um, neighborhood super blooms that um, one of the community members I worked with last weekend for our um, Earth Day resource fair, we did some pollinator garden tours because she has, her name is Juanita Salisbury, and she established the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden back in 2016. And so she finds these traffic islands and, you know, the hell strips of sidewalks where there's just nothing but ivy or weeds and plants native plants there. So the poppies like in the neighborhood where I work are incredible, especially in her Primrose Way garden. But also just, you know, when I go for a walk in my lunch hour, um, I've, I've worked here for about five years now. I've never seen the flowers like the way they are this year. It's incredible. So I don't, I don't even feel like I need to get in my car and go very far because um, the, the poppies on the hillsides, you can, you can see them from a long way away, but also the neighborhood gardens are, are really impressive too. Do you think that Juanita has ever encountered resistance that, you know, some neighborhoods or cities or ordinances will just say like no nothing here I mean I'm um, really I'm in all of these like hometown hero people right. like I'm also a hometown hero person I hope but to me it, it's to me it's just where the good work of the world is happening and she's been really successful with her pollinator gardens here in town um, she has a great relationship with the city parks department um, oh, good. We've got someone here. Let me just hit admit. Hi, welcome. We're just chatting a little bit before we get started. Um, there's one part of town where she is interested in doing some pollinator garden work, but the land is actually owned by the state rather than the city. And like when you cross boundaries like that, even though it's in the middle of town because it's part of the train area, it's like, well, you know, you can't who do we get permission from at that point? Um, but the pollinators are gardens have really taken off. I even planted two of our big plant containers outside the library with um, native plants. And so even my poppies are blooming then. So hello, Erin, welcome. Uh, we're just chatting a little bit here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce you, Denise. And uh, I'm Rebecca Cohn, a senior librarian here at Rinconada Library of Palo Alto City. 
And Janice is here with us today to talk about her entry in All We Can Save um, and about the anthology. And Janice, if you just tell us a little bit about where you are. Perfect. I live in the south of Georgia. Georgia is, is a, an interesting, interesting state because it starts at the coast, which has the Golden Isles, and it goes all the way up through like the coastal plains, the Piedmont, and then the mountains. So we have four ecosystems in this one state, and I live in the coastal plains. It's about an hour inland from Savannah, Georgia. So Savannah is the next closest town to me. I live on, I live in a small village called Reedsville, and I live 13 miles outside that village. Like I live way in the country um, on an organic farm. Uh, we were in Vermont. I'm from Georgia originally, but my husband and I lived in Vermont. And then uh, we, we moved back to Georgia and bought this really glorious farm that was built in 1850. And so on that farm, I know you don't want all this, Erin, but on yeah, that farm, <laughs> grow, like gardens, of course, so vegetables, but we also have fruit trees and blueberries. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, fruit wise, we have mulberries, gummy berries, and peaches ready. Um, and, and then we have small numbers of a lot of animals. So a tiny little herd of cows. We've never had more than 20 cows, goats, sheep, a few hogs, things like that. Lots of chickens. Okay, I was going to say there's got to be some chickens in that mix, right? <laughs> some chickens. And also this very strange animal called a guinea, a guinea hen, guinea fowl. It's an African bird, but they're naturalized to the south. So those are wonderful too. We have a couple of turkeys. Just it's it's small, but I I have to say that our children are grown, growing and out, and it makes us want to like really like I don't know. We're we're cutting back on things. We don't have any bulls, for example, or rams. Like we're not breeding any livestock right now. So right. we're more and more just growing vegetables and fruit. So maybe downsizing a little, huh? Uh, yes, we are. It's just so, I mean, for a long time, we milked a cow. And yeah, that's a lot of work. And made kefir and yogurt. And, you know, we made our own soap. We made our own wine and all, all kinds of alcohol, beer. We just were trying to make as like to prove that we could be as self-sufficient as possible. And it's a ton of work. And I'm not saying that I'm, I loved all of it. But I'm just in a different place in my life where I don't want to work so hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, this is the book that we've been focusing on this month in our Palo Alto Reads program. And one of the reasons we chose the anthology was it does have so many different voices in it. And it is a combination of um, fiction, with poetry, with art, and then the nonfiction entries are of different length and from people in you know different careers, fields of work. And I was really taken with your entry. Um, I, I did feel like I was finding a bookmark or a press leaf that someone had put in for me, especially with what you say about seeds. And, and I'm gonna ask you about that in our conversation, but I'm interested in hearing about your participation in the anthology, how did you come to it? How or how did it find you? And how you view it? Mm -hmm. I wish I had a more romantic story to tell you, Rebecca. But honestly, it, um, Ayana, when Ayana and Catherine were putting the anthology together, they were the ones that were really just seeking pieces and writers who addressed climate. So, um, so they just that I get they picked a piece out of The Seed Underground. The Seed Underground was published, I think in 2012 by Chelsea Green Publishing Company out of Vermont. And what, I'm, what I was trying to do there is, is look, so that piece was lifted from The Seed Underground. And in that book, I really wrote it for young people because we have so much uh, hopelessness and so much grief about the destruction of our atmosphere and our biodiversity on earth. And I just thought this is a place 
where there's a lot of hope for, for young people. Um, the hope, I mean, it, 20 years ago, when I, I first had a book come out that was about the longleaf pine ecosystem, and when I would go around and speak at universities, the questions that that students were asking were questions like, uh, you know, can we save the right whale? Can we bring back, is, does, does the ivory-billed woodpecker still exist? Can, can we bring back the condor? The condor? And uh, the questions over time became, can I persuade my university to use whole food? Hmm. You know, can, can we start a community garden on campus? Can we start a pollinator garden? And I just thought how, how so many stories, and I know I'm answering these questions long and I'm sorry, but okay. so many, no, that's great. Rebecca, so many stories that I've written are sad stories. They're about, you know, some forest that got logged, some pollution that got dumped. And I just couldn't really do it anymore. So I had to find a, a way to look at hope. And, and so that's how the seed underground and then this chapter on seeds. I mean, the thing is, is, is uh, okay, just one more little piece about seeds. And that is yeah. the story of seeds is a very traumatic story, right? Because these little seed companies have been being sold mm -hmm. to bigger seed companies. Right. So we're conglomerating and monopolizing our seed supply. Our seed supply is our food supply. And it's totally worrisome to me that we're losing all these heirloom, non-GMO, mom and pop, locally adapted, place-based seeds. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I had to write about it. And, and I, all around me, I was seeing people really doing something about it. So that's the thing that I'm addressing in there. Well, and one of the things that's come up in the conversation around the book is the emphasis on community that the book promotes and that, you know, we have to get to know each other and we have to get to um, embracing the strategies for people who are experiencing the trauma and the hopelessness, like what are, you know, what are things that we can do? And um, there's an essay in here where one of the writers calls out the people that she calls doomer dudes. <laughs> and I got a really big kick out of that, just in terms of being able to, to reframe that conversation and, and, you know, seeing these, these pieces in dialogue with each other. Um, so let's talk about environmental writing and um, anything you want to tell us about it, but also like where you see the role of environmental writing currently. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, I was young. I had a degree in creative writing and I really loved, was really concerned about the environment, about sustainability. And I was, you know, you know how it is where you're just like doing vision quests and laying yourself prone on the ground, praying, like, what is my mission in life? What was I put here to do? I had gone to South America, to Colombia to teach English, you know, which I didn't even really agree with doing, but I wanted adventure. And I was walking deep in the Andes thinking about, okay, when I get back to the United States, what am I going to do? And I kept thinking, you know, writing nature, writing nature. And then it, it just like hit me on this deep dirt road way in the countryside of Colombia, like put them together, nature writing. I didn't even really realize it was a genre. Um, the genre of creative, well, it's a, I guess it's a genre, kind of. The, the genre of creative nonfiction was brand new. We had these three mm -hmm. genres and suddenly we had a fourth genre where we could write the truth. We could write facts, but in a literary way. So we could be a poet and mm -hmm. be a nonfiction writer. And I was so taken with that. And when I came back to the United States, I began to volunteer at Florida Wildlife Magazine and join the Audubon Society. For me, so, so let me skip ahead and just tell you, Rebecca, what environmental writing means to me right now. I think that story is, is the one thing that can save us. 
There are lots of ways that we as human beings transform. My belief is in the goodness of human beings and that we all desire, all of us at some level, to transform, transmogrify into better and better versions of ourselves. I really truly believe that of humans. I can't, I sort of can't not believe otherwise. There, we can transform through being in relationship, you know, like relationship with the other is the best way toward transformation because somebody's going to call you out on the things you do that aren't appropriate, for example. Hopefully they will. You can transform through good medicine, through good counseling, lots of ways. But story has story has transformation written into the narrative arc. So that at the top of the narrative arc is this thing called epiphany. Epiphany is the flash of understanding, which some writer has, writes about it, and then the reader, the reader who is hungry to know what other people know so that that informs our lives, the reader is then transformed. Um, when we're when we're small, one, two, three, we're very self-absorbed. When we're about four, we develop this thing called a habit of mind where we begin to be able to empathize. We can suddenly see our mom is working very hard or our dad is working very hard to get dinner on the table, right? And that allows us to look at somebody like read about George Washington Carver and empathize, you know, understand, try to understand. And, and that's why story is important. I studied with the great Western writer, William Kittredge. I, I got my MFA at the University of Montana. William, uh, Bill, I call him, Bill said that we're, this is the most important work our society is doing right now, that we are trying to find the stories that show us the way forward to a better world, a better life. Finding that story, like increment by increment, my little piece of it, Ayana's little, Ayana's piece, Catherine's piece, everybody in here, Janine's piece, that when we, he, Kittredge always believed that when we found the story, that our institutions would change almost instantly. I think, and, and I'm going to hush, but I think that a lot of forces in this world push against us finding the story and they push against us making the change when we do find it. So there are a lot of dominant paradigms that are paradigms actually of destruction, you know, actually of fragmentation of yeah. our communities, our atmosphere, our, our biosphere, our ecosystems. But all my life, I have and continue to believe in the power of story as a transformative art. If we didn't have Terry Tempest Williams writing about Escalante Canyon, it wouldn't have been saved. If we didn't have Marjorie Stoneman Douglas writing about the great river of grass, the Everglades, uh, we wouldn't have preserved the Everglades. I. I, I continue to believe this every day I wake up with this burning inside me that stories can save us, which is why, Rebecca, that libraries are so important. And thank you for being there. Thank you for letting us check out your books for free because our lives change because of what you do. Well, I'm really interested in what you said about um, creative nonfiction becoming another genre because um, and thank you for your nice comments about libraries that's always very much appreciated um, because I remember I was an English major that it seemed like those columns of fiction and nonfiction um, were just really hard concrete silos and yeah. So I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the terrain.org website, because I find myself going to that frequently when I kind of want like 
some tasty nonfiction, <laughs> like some stories about people's experiences, people's experience in nature, and also the photography too. I think um, we are in a, an amazing time of, you know, communicating through a visual narrative as well. Um, so tell us about that website, either um, your mm -hmm. work with it or anything else we should know about it. When I was first beginning to write, you know, as a young woman, the flagship environmental writing um, organization and vehicle was a magazine called Orion. It was put out, it, it came out of Massachusetts, Western Mass um, via uh, an organization called the Orion Society. And what is amazing is, is, is somewhere, maybe I think it's 20 years ago exactly, Simmons Bunting, who is the editor-in-chief and the founder of Terrain.org, just got in, he got, with somebody else, he got this vision in mind to begin this online magazine, which they did. And it's just, it's been doing so incredibly well. It's all an all-volunteer staff. Wow. They very carefully, very closely read the material that the submissions they receive and and they're not only committed to environmental justice and environmental movement environmental you know um, restoration but also social justice so I too am tremendously impressed by their work and I too go there for inspiration and 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 just the feeling that the world is not running away from us, you know, it's not like it's not all just the 140 character tweet. You know? <laughs> I, 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 I go for long form <laughs> journalism. Yeah. Well, I do feel it's very um, well curated. It's one that when I go to. Um, like I want to read all of these links. Um, you know, it's definitely one that um, that I enjoy. And you know, we're in we're in kind of a tough time in publishing, like with the number of magazines that have seized. Um, I remember, like, I used to read Discover Magazine a lot, um, and I also feel like some of the old standards, like Smithsonian, like it's not even as thick as it used to be, and. It, just in terms of like where the the back and forth, the conversation, the the places for environmental writing, uh, what are your thoughts just in terms of like if people are interested in that, what are the platforms they should know about or what are like like with this group starting their own site? Um, Anything you want to talk about just in terms of the, the internet landscape and then also the traditional landscape for publishing in this area? Well, I think it's super exciting right now. Um, I think we're, you know, so for years and years and years, nature writing was a marginal literature. You know, it would be like, um, I mean, there are lots of marginal literatures, but it definitely was not mainstream. And then I, th it just totally began to change. And now it's almost the most mainstream literature as it should be, because if we don't solve and, you know, honestly, we may not solve. If we don't solve some, some of the, the most pressing problem, which is climate, the climate chaos, um, we're in for some really rough times, some rough weather ahead. Um, so I think, uh, I think people are just, people are, people understand that they're craving to know more. They're seeking more, um, not just train and not just Orion and not even, you know, like the big magazines are now, right. Are now producing more and more stories that are important, like, Elizabeth Colbert and, and so forth. But there are a plethora of tiny magazines like Tiny Seed Journal. Hmm. So if a person is interested in publishing in this realm, I would I would look to I would go on submittable where most, you know, many most writers um, uh, submit submittable.com 
dot com, I guess it is. And I would I would type in creative nonfiction and nature. And there will be dozens of places to send your work. So and that's what I would do. If you have a dedicated audience already, like from a blog or a Patreon site or something else that you've been doing, or you just have a, you're an influencer and you have a large following on social media, I would highly recommend uh, a Substack. Uh, I think it's a Substack would be like having your own column in the paper and you could you would do it weekly or bi-weekly or monthly or whatever you set up daily if you're Heather Cox Richardson, amazingly. But I, I think that's also a very viable place. Um, in this case, you might even want to take out the word nature hmm. in submittable when you're under the discover cat tab and you just put in creative nonfiction or flash nonfiction or whatever you, whatever you write there. Um, because many, many, many literary magazines, college magazines, e-zines are taking, even, even if they don't have a focus solely on environmental literature, they often have a bent toward environmental literature. So yeah, I encourage people to do it. It's, I will also say that when I first began as a writer, uh, I just thought my job was to write flowery prose about the kestrel I just saw land on the wire and <laughs> those sheets of California poppies. <laughs> All the beautiful stuff, right? But in the past few years, when I realized the, the reader is a hero for reading. You know, I'm not the hero for writing this. The reader is the hero. Hmm. And I don't want to move my life forward. I want to help other people find meaning and joy and, and nourishment in their lives. That um, I forgot what I was going to say. What was I talking about? Um, you were talking about the role of the reader as the hero. Yes. Yes. So I have begun to focus more on tension and, and learning how to build tension in the work so that I can get the reader through the first line and then on to the second line and then get them hooked. One of my first teachers was an environmental writer named Alan Wiseman. And he said, whatever environmental story you want to tell, hook it on a person. Hmm that we as humans will read a person, a story about a human narrative because we want to know what happens to each other. We may not read about sugar plantations, sugarcane plantations in the Everglades, but if you give us a person whose life was severely affected by the runoff from this sugarcane or it took away something from them, the reader will follow you to the end. So. That was that was great advice that I got many years ago, but I've gotten serious about all the ways that we that we aren't lazy as writers, Rebecca, that we write page turners or paragraph turners, you know, and some things are clicking into place in my mind in terms of what you said about creative nonfiction, because as someone who you know follows environmental topics a lot of the documentation can be pretty dry, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially if you're looking at things like, you know, environmental quality reports, um, or if you're looking at, um, you know, some of the, the land use issues, it, it can get really technical. And um, this kind of gets in, into my, my next question about connecting environmental work and community knowledge. So I just wanted to give you an example of some of the assumptions about a place, but what's what's underneath. Um, Silicon Valley has lots of associations. One is the technology community and words like millionaire and unicorn and venture capital are attached to that. But Santa Clara County has 23 Superfund sites, which is more than any other county 
in the whole country. And they're all due to the manufacture of silicon chips and semiconductors. Um, and I learned about this when I was uh, interested, you know, becoming more interested in birding in the area. And I learned that there were burrowing owls really close to where I live in Mountain View, but a lot of them were on the, the NASA Ames site, Moffett Field, which was a former Navy site. Um, and it's a super fun site. It's like, I can see it from my house. <laughs> you know, that was not anything I really expected. So, you know, in terms of the, the image that gets projected about a place, but then what's really under the ground or on the ground, um, what are some perceptions that you have observed about the South that may or may not contrast with environmental realities that you see? First of all, I'm so sorry about all those super fun sites. Yeah. That's tragic. Yeah, it's pretty and bad. I'm sorry personally, you know, that my use of a computer has contributed to that. I'm so yeah. sorry. And I'm really sorry that you can see one from your house. So stay well, safe. Don't, don't, feel, don't, feel, don't feel too bad because the EPA does a great job and sort of the California Water Board. Um, right. There are, I mean, one of the good things about a site being designated as a super fund is that the government is then required to fund the cleanup and the companies that caused it are, are required to contribute to that fund. So, you know, it's not like a situation that's ongoing or they, they don't know about it. There is remediation happening. Um, but yeah, I think Silicon Valley in a way has worked really hard to detach themselves from the impact on the environment so but anyway so um, in regards rebecca in regards to the south and and you know misconceptions misperceptions one is that so we have we do have a lot of super fun sites and we do have a lot of pollution um a lot of the of it is is found in environ in in areas where low-income neighborhoods or areas where people of color live. So there's a lot of environmental racism. Um, the more that I know about, you know, as a U.S. citizen, not just as a Southerner, is that this, that is everywhere. Like environmental racism is everywhere. But I, I have to acknowledge that it has been particularly terrible in the South. The the petroleum um, processing plants off the coast of Louisiana, for example, are just dramatically affecting um, those the communities of uh, of Cajun folks and and Native American tribes in southern Louisiana. We have some Superfund sites. The closest to me are in Brunswick, Georgia, and almost all of them them are in low-income and predominantly African-American neighborhoods, which is terrible, tragic, sad. Okay, the thing about the South is that a lot of the South is still rural. And we, you know, our, our like our, the essence of rural in our minds, the way we perceive it is that it's, clean, its people are salt of the earth, we are farmers. And what I have come to understand is that some of the worst point source pollution in the world is coming off of these rural, like, no, we're not factories. We're, you know, we're nowhere near Silicon Valley, but but the, the point source pollutions for Roundup, for example, for farmers' fields, for all these ways that we, we look at the South and we think, oh, it's, it's so country, it's so cool, it's cute, and yet incredibly polluted. And that has been very difficult for me to, to accept. And that's because I am, I am a rural person, like if, if on the, on the spectrum, if I could choose my favorite place to live, it would be like at the edge of the, of a field between the field and the wild. 
like I just love that whole rural life go into the woods come back and garden and I love that and yet I see in my place pollution all around me I'm nervous about the water coming through my tap you mm. know so I want to say that, that I think that there are misperceptions about the South, that we are so rural and so clean. And we would also have those about the Midwest with all the cornfields, with all the GMO corn, with all the genetic drift. It's like the, the, the places we think of as healthy are often not healthy. There is no place on the globe that some form of pollution has not touched. Um, I also want... Let me just make sure I've made a couple of notes here. Less industrial, super fun sites. Yeah, that's pretty much, much it. It's, I, I, I think I would, if I could, would come back to anything, it would also be racism. And, and that is that the South kept slavery. You know, what a terrible, awful thing that happened. Terrible. And Yet I've lived in other parts of the, you know, I lived in Montana, I've lived in Vermont. Racism is everywhere. That means environmental racism is everywhere. Mm -hmm. The one last point that I want to make about the South is that by the time the movement to protect large grandiose landscapes like Yellowstone and Glacier had come about in the late in the late 1800s, the South was pretty much already settled. My county, for example, was settled in was was my county became a county in 1801. It was beginning mm. to be settled in the 1700s, the latter part of the 1700s. So by the time we're understanding that it's important for people's mental health and their physical health to save to save um, the glaciers or to save the Yellowstones of the world, we we were already beyond that. We were already mm -hmm. deep into farming, into cotton, into plantations. So we don't have the protected land that you do out West. That is a tremendous disservice to the people of the South, to people of the whole country. There was no more beautiful state the Florida, for example, no more beautiful. It's the subtropics all the way down to the tropics has this karst limestone base. That meant these glorious sinkholes would drop into the limestone. Glor it's just, it really, truly, La Florida was a paradise. Georgia too, um, the, lucky for us, we saved many, we have a, a string of barrier islands along the coast of, of Georgia, very famous ones. Wealthy people during the industrial age came down and protected them. Lucky for us, they did. Our marshlands are protected. We have a marshland protect protection act. Right now, we're deep into trying to protect Okefenokee Swamp, like the greatest swamp in the world and swamp so important to climate change from titanium mining so mm, wow and we're also let, let me just mention one other thing not to rattle on but we have a we have a national park it was a national historical park in central georgia called oak Mulgee. this was the homeland of the muscogee creek people um it was where they first sat down in their words mm. we are in a huge movement battle love fest right now to be, for that to become Oak Mulgee National Park. That would be the first real national park in the state of Georgia. So just hoping it happens. Okay, we will be sending our good energy for that to happen. Okay. Um, one of the things that it kind of loops back to the idea of celebrating beauty and environmental writing, but not, you know, falling into that as a trope, um, I think is expanding people's definition of, of beauty, like getting away from the, you know, European 19th century landscape 
paintings. And so I'll put you on the spot for a second. Tell us about this swamp. Why is it a great swamp? So first of all, it's large. You know, it's it's a it was protected as a wilderness area. It's a national wildlife refuge, but there is like pure wilderness, meaning, you know, no human structures can be built there. You know, after when the wilderness starts, you can canoe or kayak, but you can't put a motorboat in there. But it's it's just hundreds of square miles of peat, a peat bog. Hmm. And peat holds, you know, it's 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 storing carbon. So this swamp. It, it contains these ecosystems like carnivorous bogs, um, these meadows that are filled with pretty much five different kinds of carnivorous plants. And, and when I say kinds, I really mean species. So bladderwort, which bladderwort is so it has, it has a flower above water, but it lives in water. And then it has these translucent bladders that, tra that trap bacteria and that it then consumes. It has pitcher plants. Do you have any of these in California? I think we have some. Yeah. Um, we have sundews, which are like Venus flytraps, but very mm. tiny. Okay, what am I missing? I think I'm missing one. Some places, I don't think there are any in Okefenokee, but there are a few places in the South that do have Venus flytraps. There's one uh, carnivorous plant that I'm missing, but it's it's just an extraordinary ecosystem. One of the wonders of the world, people come from all over the world to see it. And yet it was formed because it's an old sand dune from the Pleistocene era. So the Pleistocene ocean came up into the coastal plains all the way to the Piedmont. The Piedmont sort of drops off and then the coastal plain starts, and that was the edge of the Pleistocene Ocean. So, so you have a sand dune that is holding this bog in place that's hundreds of square miles. I can't even, I think 700. We could look it up pretty quickly. But the mining is to take place. The titanium is in the old sand dune. Mm. It's in the ridge that would have held back the seawater at one point. Mm. So mining in there would completely disrupt the water pattern and the water flow and even the, the kind of damming quality of mm. that ridge. I would like you to come visit me in Georgia and I might have to. I might have to see oh this my swamp. Gosh, Rebecca, I have to kayak you out through Okefenokee Swamp. It's full of alligators and you know mink and just black bear everywhere. It's a gorgeous place. So to you can cross it. It's 30 miles across and you sleep on platforms. So these platforms have been built. And so you, you'll you paddle about 14 miles in a day, sleep on a platform, then paddle some more, sleep on a day. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Yeah. And I think in terms of, I'm like, now my understanding what swamp means is, is completely different, right? Just from hearing this description. Because I think also sometimes when people hear a word, you just go with your first association, swamp, swampy. Mm, that doesn't sound comfortable. <laughs> you know? no, doesn't, yeah. like, but, you know, being able to know what's what's there um, can change your mind. You know, I think that it is was misnamed, really. And I don't know what you would call it, but you may call it like a wet meadow. It's 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 just a peat bog. Full of peat. The, it, the, the Okefenokee word means land of the trembling earth because the peat, you could get out and, I mean, you have water trails through the swamp, what we call the swamp, but you could also get out on the peat and when you walk, it's shaking because it's just a mass of vegetation. It's like squishy, like wet grass. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Sphagnum moss usually, yeah. And, you know, just in terms of uh, you know the the sense of wonder and and curiosity that that can come from exploring nature. Um, I've been enjoying your ecology of a cracker childhood, and um, for 
for our, our participants, I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about the kind of exploration that you had access to as a child and the kinds of things that you liked to explore. I was raised on a junkyard uh, outside a little town called Baxley, Georgia. And my dad owned 10 acres of, you know, junk cars. So he was an early recycler, which, you know, I never heard that word growing up. Um, in the junkyard, we had free run of the junkyard, my brothers and sister and I. But in the junkyard were things like, you know, a clump of pitcher plants. It had been a wetland at some point. Mm -hmm and had been drained. And then my dad just began to drag old cars there so he could sell carburetors and mufflers and whatever people wanted, hubcaps. It was, I was only, it was not until I was an adult that I realized that it had, that, that the junkyard sat within an ecosystem that once covered the entire Southern U.S. Hmm. 93 million acres from Southern Virginia, all the way around that, you know, right hip of the country, all the way to East Texas. It's an incredible ecosystem that involved that evolved with fire. It, there are more lightning strikes per area per square mile here than anywhere. And so the lightning would strike and set wire grass afire. The trees so evolved with fire that they have multiple ways that they survive, that the fire, the fire just sweeps through and leaves the growing bud of young trees. Or if the tree is, if the tree is out of range, then it just, you know, it just got passes their bark and keeps going. Hmm. But you grow fires every two to three to four years during the growing season, preferably, that would just sweep through and keep. Um, you know the word like park-like so so the savannas of Africa would have random trees so that kind of park-like beauty but I will tell you um, when when we insisted in the south on continuing the enslavement of humans and then fought our own country and lost we then sort of became a colony of our country. Mm. So a lot, you know, right in that period after the Civil War, up until 1900, um, pretty much, well, 99% of our longleaf forests were cut. It was an apocalyptic loss. There's a large movement now to restore longleaf. It's a national movement. And a lot has been restored. So, uh, you know, I have hope for Longleaf. Longleaf now has, not just because of my book, but because of lots of, of books and movies, Longleaf has just thousands of aficionados and thousands of people replanting it. And just it, I mean, many, many thousands of people have fallen in love with Longleaf Pine. So I don't really worry about it so much anymore. It's 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 going to be okay, I think. I, I worry about the global issues more. So in that book, just one more thing about it, and that is that I alternate chapters between personal history in the junkyard. My dad also had a, a mental illness. He was manic. To, he, yeah, he had bipolar mental illness. And... Um, we were very poor. So I use all these. And we also belong to a, my dad believed in a very fundamentalist religion called apostolic. So I use though that, you know, I knew my childhood was interesting, but, and I knew that I probably wouldn't get somebody interested in reading a book about a pine tree so it, it's so interestingly that we return to this question of how to write with tension I wasn't necessarily writing with tension but I was using people to tell what I consider is a greater story the loss of an entire ecosystem that covered the coastal plains of one entire region of the country and the Brooklyn Bridge was built out of longleaf pine. You know, I mean, what? Yeah. I did not know that. 
Oh, I, I know this pine by heart now. I can recognize <laughs> it almost anywhere I go. I go into buildings in the north and I'm like, Built oh, up. you can see it. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's a, it is a, there's none in here. I'm, I'm in, in town and in, in my office. Um, but it's a, it's a deeply resonant, almost red wood. It's mm. very, full of resins, very long lasting, very sturdy. It's a, a gorgeous wood. You know, whenever I'm in an older building, uh, and it has the original wood floors. I always love to look at them, you know, from the days when the planks were so big that yeah. because the trees were that big and there were that many of them, they could just make. And my favorite thing is to put my foot across the width of it and see, you know, is this plank bigger than my foot? Um, so it's really interesting to, to think about how how those trees were literally migrated. But I I especially liked the title of of your book because I also think of of thinking about childhood as an ecology of itself mm -hmm. that you know that time in someone's life is also a landscape uh, uh an environment of its own so mm -hmm. um if if you enjoy the anthology i i i, I recommend this book too so um we're okay. at 10 minutes till and i i wanted to to sum up a little bit here um, in your entry in the anthology, you conclude with the message on all the edges plant seeds. And we've talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the importance of seed saving and some of the national challenges about it. Um, so we can think about it literally, but also, you know, metaphorically, what are some of the other ways that we can, can plant seeds of ideas, of action, or even the literal planting of seeds, if you want to talk about that too. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I read that one short paragraph so that please, we can hold in your please mind do. Mind? Yeah. How shall we live as if we believe in the future, as if every one of us is a seed, which, as you know, is a sacred thing? In my wildest dreams, the seeds of every species are speaking to me, calling out, in all the bare spots on earth, plant us and let us grow. On all the edges, plant seeds. So what I'm talking about there is like, what a tough thing it is to live on planet earth right now. There are just, you know, there are just so many edges. And we create edges when we destroy one one ecosystem and and you know then the lawns of the the lawns of the neighborhood bump up against what's left of the forest that's an edge the edge is often seen as a dangerous place a frightening place but i think because we're on the edge of wildfire we're on the edge of potent powerful hurricanes we're on the edge of drought we're always on the edge of some disaster really that we especially millennials and gen xers and and young younger folks than i have to get used we all have to get used to living on an edge it's an uncomfortable place to be so the metaphor of seeds is that I think it's our responsibility to do everything we can to stop this. I, I have had a number of conversations with Bill McKibben, who, who, mm. you know, as you know, is a, is a, a hero, a climate activist, one, you know, our country's best climate activist. And Bill knows that we need policy changes. We have to improve emission standards on cars. We have to do more and more electric cars. We have to stop, you know, the building of new coal powered plants. We have to shut down coal powered plants and, and on and on. But I have always come at my personal life and my environmental work through an ethos, like through, uh, through like a moral instinct into this dilemma that we face, which is what do we do about this? I, I, for example, I, I'm also almost embarrassed to say this because this is how far out 
I am from the dominant paradigm. I have not flown on an airplane in 15 years. Mm -hmm. I made that choice. I do drive a car. The car is an electric car. I, you know, I, I use electricity. I have not, we don't have solar panels on our house yet, although it's on our, like we're saving for solar panels. I'm, I'm no saint and I'm no angel, but I believe that if you don't walk your talk, then you are practicing a kind of, a really a kind of schizophrenia. Mm. You believe one mm. thing, like you believe one thing with all your heart, but you don't do it then you are a divided person. Mm. And Rebecca, I don't want to live divided. So everything, I believe that sustainability is a spectrum, a continuum. And I'm always trying, you know, I'm always trying to move. I want to be radically sustainable. Am I going to ever fly again? Yes, I will probably, if my son lives in Massachusetts, Silas is 35. If if Silas got ill today, I would be making my way to the Savannah airport to get to him. But I have managed to travel by train and by hybrid car for 15 years or by bicycle. We have horses as well for 15 years. So that's where I, I know that not everybody can own land. I know that not everybody can even live you know, not everybody can live outside of a high rise. Not everybody can have a piece of land. But I'm going to try every day with my hands, with my body, with my heart to not cause more harm on this glorious planet that we've been loaned. I really thank you for that perspective. And I think this issue of feeling conflict um, about values and actions um, that really distills some of the, the conversation in the anthology about people's fe feeling fearful and feeling like what matters, you know, does it matter if I do this? And um, I think it is important to decide what what matters and where where you're comfortable on the on the spectrum of sustainability. Um, Janice, thank you. This has been absolutely a joy to talk with you. And um, maybe I will hop an Amtrak to Georgia and come see that fantastic swamp. Uh, to my participants, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. And um, Denise, I'm so glad that uh, we picked this anthology so I could find my way to you. You are no more glad than I am. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you all of Palo Alto Reads and Palo Alto in general. And thank you to all your libraries. I am so grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for loving the earth, for caring about it, for want, wanting to educate and encourage and inspire other people. I am, I personally am so grateful to you and all of you.